distributed. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our special provision and EPS funding webinar this afternoon. I am Jane McLucas and I am the Director of Child Nutrition. And with me today I have. This is Paula Gravel, Director of School Finance. And Alexandra Cookson, Data Quality Trainer with the Data Team at the DOE. So we're really excited to have these partners um, and work and be able, be able to work across district with people um, to bring you the most the best information that we can um, all together. So first we're gonna talk a little child nutrition. Um, this operation is a variance of our traditional programming. So we typically do a traditional program. Um, we also have special, pro, special provisions. One of those is the community eligibility provision, which we call CEB and our special two provision, which we call SP2. And we'll be using those acronyms as we go along. So what does it mean to be a special provision school? Students at special provision schools receive meals at no charge. We reduce the administrative burden on the child nutrition programs by eliminating applications. Child nutrition programs no longer claim meals at the benefit level for the individual student after the base year in a special provision two program. And base year claiming percentages or direct certification percentages are used to determine the claim percentage each month. Child nutrition programs are no longer required to collect the free and reduced applications after the base year. And using special provision programs is a great way for us to be able to leverage federal, federal funds used to reimburse student meals within the state. So we have some programs already using community eligibility um, and we are hoping that more come on this year. Um, in order to qualify for a community eligibility program, the school must qualify for 40% of their students must be directly certified. They also call this the individual's ISP, individual student percentage. Um, the formula includes a multiplier, which is currently 1.6. This is federal and they tell us what multiplier to use. Um, and this is to capture students who might qualify for benefits, but are not included on the direct certification list. All students receive meals at no charge. CEP is a four-year cycle. No longer do we collect free and reduced applications. We must resubmit data every four years. And I'd just like to note that last year, not all schools that qualified participated in this program. Um, and encourage schools that are below that 40% or above that 50, 40% to really think about using this program. Um, it's a great way to leverage those federal funds. So community eligibility provision starts with your April 1st data. This data is really important and I'm gonna encourage that every school nutrition program collect this data. Um, so you should pull your master list on April 3rd this year because April 1st is on a Saturday. And your master list is a list of your all your students, your student enrollment with your student benefit information included. Currently the identified student percentage, the ISP to qualify again is 40%. And the ISP is the number of students divided by total enrollment. Districts can use this data to apply or reapply for CEP or special provision two. And it's a great way to compare your numbers across years because you will no longer have free and reduced data to use to compare and look at your programs, see if there is an increase or decrease it's really important to have some set of quality data to be able to compare. 
So you'll be able to use this data um, to compare with your original submissions, to see if your numbers go up or you're down, if you can qualify for CEP, your numbers might go up. You might wanna reapply again next year if your numbers go up. If you're a special provision two, you'll wanna discuss with your administration about finding to see if you wanna start a new base year because your percentages have changed. And it's use this data to apply for extensions at the end of your cycle. So this data is really important. I really do encourage everybody to make sure that they pull this data on the first and make sure that they hold on to it. In CEP, for qualifying for a single school, in this example, um, all of these schools would qualify for a CEP school because their individual school percentage is higher than 40. I'm pointing to the screen if you can't tell. <laughs> um, and then you would use your multiplier. The multiplier is what you would be able to claim your federal reimbursement with. So that extra multiplier really does help. Um, so as I said, all these schools would qualify on their own. Um, and just a point, you um, decimal points all have to be rounded to do two decimal points. Um, and you can't round in special revisions. You can also group a, qualify a group of schools in this example. So this school district from the, the previous slide, all the top three schools would qualify, they're in green, but the red school was only at 25%. This would not qualify on its own, but if you put it with a group of schools, you would still meet the qualifier of the 40% ISP, and then all of the schools would use the 72.09 percentage to, for their claims. So rather than use the individual school multiplier, you would use the group multiplier, but you could include that one school that didn't qualify on its own. So it's a great way to to have all of your schools in your district doing the same thing, if you can use those numbers to do that. In special provisions, um, any school can participate. So that's the difference between CEP and special provisions. Um, it is based on an individual school data and the reimbursement rates are determined by your base year data. So Everybody that claim that's doing special provision to this year, that's in a base year, collected that April 1st data last year. And that data is the data that's going to be used for the next three years. So it's really important that we have that, that data and quality data. Schools can ask for an extension after that four years if there hasn't been a significant shift in the demographics. So a base year calculation for special provisions. So we use St. Patrick's Elementary School. We all know when I was doing this, right? So they had 10,000 meals um, over the course of the school year. So that's what we learned on their base year was that they served 10,000 meals. And of those meals, 35% were free, 5% were reduced, and 60% were paid. For the next three years, we will use those percentages on your total enrollment. So in September, if you served, in next September, if you served 1,000 meals, then we would reimburse you with the federal funds. 350 of those meals would be free, 50 would be reduced, and 600 would be paid. Then the state would supplement the difference um, up to the full free meal reimbursement rate. Doing special provision two and CEP gives you some options in the cafeteria. 
I wanted to make sure that we stressed every district must have a plan in place to ensure that students are only receiving one meal per meal period, so for breakfast or for lunch. As long as you have a plan in place to make sure that this is happening, you can use any of these options. Just a reminder, count must be taken at the point of service, which is at the end of the line, so that you make sure that those students have meals that are reimbursable. So in a small group setting, such as a classroom, you might wanna use a checklist. If you have a smaller lunch service, you might wanna use a clicker. Or at a high school where you have a lot of kids coming in and out and all over the place, you might wanna to continue to use those PIN numbers and use a point of sale service. Um, tick sheets are also an option. So just remember, it's really important that you have that plan in place to make sure that those students are only receiving one meal. In the child nutrition office, you're gonna no longer be collecting those free and reduced applications. We can, you are still required to collect that direct certification information and you need to upload that at least three times a year, if not more. And then any other collections of forms would be an unallowable expense to the child nutrition program. And collections of an alternate form should ideally be done outside of the child nutrition department. If child nutrition is included in collecting any of those alternate forms, they should be compensated with funds outside of the child nutrition funds for time and supplies. So there's 74 districts that are currently operating CEP and we'll have an additional 100 SAUs that are gonna be doing special provision to in a non-base year next year. So it's really important. Again, pull that April 1st data on the 3rd. No free and reduced applications and just a tip. I go around your district and destroy any old applications that are on hand because you don't want to be starting a new base year just because somebody filled out an application. Um, so really encouraged, go through those secretary's drawers and collect all those and destroy them, get rid of them. Um, discuss, now is the time to discuss how your cafeterias are going to operate and what tools you're going to use to make sure that you're meeting the requirements. And remember that people, other people in your administration have not collected forms for the amount of years that you have. And you have the knowledge that you can share with your districts um, when it comes to completing and collecting um, applications. So share that knowledge with your administration um, and help them get ready for um, the upcoming school year. And I wish you all the best of luck. I hope it's something you really enjoy. And Allie's gonna take it over um, with the help desk. All right, so on the Maine Department of Education webpage under data reporting, data and reporting, there is our help desk website and there are quite a few resources that are available under um, that the alternate economic status form that was just being referred to by Jane is under EPS guides and that is able to be used in place of the free and reduced lunch form in order to report economically disadvantaged students. The EPS, the um, economically disadvantaged students still count toward EPS and previously that was collected with free and reduced lunch forms. However, with this change that is no longer allowable um, for child nutrition purposes, um, this alternate form can be used in place of that. Um, so that website is available for um, business managers, um, school administrative assistants. Um, those are the people who should be completing this form for EPS purposes. So just to clarify a little bit, this is Paula Grubel, uh, School Funding. And just to clarify why 
we are offering an alternate form um, for economic disadvantage status. It's because for EPS purposes at this time, EPS, sorry if you don't know, essential programs and services, which is the state funding formula for state funds for school, public schools. Uh, we still need to collect information about student economically disadvantaged status every year for purposes of the state funding through the EPS formula. So while you're, you do not need to collect it every collect the same information every year now for nutrition purposes, if you are one of these uh, special provision or CEP schools, we do still need the similar data, not, not exactly, but similar data collected for purposes of the state funding formula. Now we are looking into other options for that, but right now this is the statute, this is the statute is defined for funding as eligible for reduce, free and reduced lunch. So we need to, uh, we're, we're looking into other ways of doing this, but in the meantime, the reason that uh, Allie and I were excited to join Jane today is that we wanna make sure everybody in the field understands that there's a separation, there's a difference between the nutrition forms and the essential programs and services funding forms even though it's the it's it's the same data collection type type of data collection and so i want to make sure everybody understands that and so if anybody has questions about that i really would um, encourage you to uh, speak to a business manager um, call our office school funding um, the, at the doe or the help desk and we would be happy to explain the difference uh, but we still need annual collection of economically disadvantaged student information which is a little different than the free and reduced lunch information for nutrition it's just trying to explain the difference and then not get everybody confused uh hopefully we've done that um so i th i think So just to clarify, there are three different ways that a student can be um, recognized as economically disadvantaged. Um, this image over here on the side will kind of explain the different tiers that can be used for that. Um, students who are on your direct certification list will be automatically marked and flagged in state synergy as um, economically disadvantaged. Um, the other way is to have your free and reduced lunch forms. This will not be a way that CEPs and the special um, provision schools will be able to do their collection. We would recommend instead using the alternate economic status form with the majority of your students um, to ensure that that comes back accurately from your, um, your families. And keep in mind the alternate economic status form and not be used for nutrition purposes. It is not to be used for free or reduced lunch, actual nutrition, lunch, feeding kids. It is strictly for use in the essential programs and services funding model. So this is what the form looks like over on this side here. Um, this form is found on that uh, help desk website that was on the previous slide, the two previous slides. Um, and this can be used by all families. Um, we uh, would recommend sending this out along with your free and reduced lunch form and explaining the importance of the funding and how you can, how it can be used to um, receive additional funding for your district. Um, this form can be used with all of your students. Uh, it's used to determine economic disadvantage for EPS funding solely, um, and it's entered into state synergy, but it should be entered by someone who is not in, involved with child nutrition. Um, so ensure that whoever is involved with putting this information in is not associated with your child nutrition program to ensure that you don't have to reset your uh, CEP or special provision to services. And this form is a template. You can adjust it as needed. Uh, the requirements are that we identify students as either eligible for free or reduced lunch according to federal guidelines, which is provided on the form. If you want to create an online uh, system of collecting this information, that works. Um, and then if any questions about how to enter the information into your student information system, Allie and her team at the help desk can certainly help with that.
So that's all we have on our end that we wanted to share. We, if you do have any questions, you are able to put them in the chat box. In the question box, please. In the question box, please. <laughs> and Paula will share those with us. Free and reduced applications no longer required or not allowed while on SP2. Not allowed while on SP2. Except for, sure. Except for when you're on a base year. How do you find your multiplier of 1.6 like in the example you showed? Everybody uses the same multiplier as 1.6. I can answer this one. Yes, the presentation will be on our <laughs> website. Um, hopefully this afternoon it'll be on the child nutrition website under our webinars and training under the child nutrition update uh, bar. Can you specify that blank applications forms can, must be destroyed, but the completed ones <laughs> should be maintained for the base year? Yes, applications that are filled out should be maintained for the base year. Um, my tip for collecting old applications is to get them out of your schools so that people don't inadvertently hand them out um, to families and interrupt your pattern. Will this be relayed to our business managers and superintendents on our behalf? This is a hard task for school nutrition directors to explain without it ending up on our plate. Yes, this is Paula Gravel and the, the main reason I'm here is to ensure that business managers and superintendents understand the difference between what you're doing as food service directors and what we're doing uh, for, for state funding. And so I have been in connection with them. I plan to provide this entire webinar to, uh, to both of those uh, individuals uh, to help with this. So please, uh, if there is questions, you can point them in my direction. And we usually mention it when we do our October 1st as well. It's so nice to have you guys with us <laughs> and know that you're supporting us. I know the field appreciates here. that. Yeah. We all work together as a team. <laughs> That's right. When do we send these home? In the fall? Which ones? The EPS funding formulas? Mm -hmm. Yes, the EPS forms are, are part of the October 1 collection. And so uh, this is status uh, as of October 1 for your students. So are they economic considered economically disadvantaged on October 1? And that's in the fall. Are they due by October 1? So it's the October 1 collection, which you would enter into the system by October 15th. Mm -hmm. And then it needs to be certified by your superintendent by October 30th. Yes. But it's only looking at data for the first year. Right. It's the, what are they on the first? How does SP2 affect title grant funding? <laughs> well, what do you think, Paula? Uh, well, so I, I actually only handle state funding, not uh, title funding. However, there's another uh, discussion about that that's coming out very soon. The Title I team has been getting together and discussing uh, this collection. And so what we can do is provide information after that conversation comes out uh, regarding exactly how Title I is managed, consider, especially considering Special Provision Two. How does that sound? That sounds really great. Yeah. Does the form carry over for 30 days after the start of school like the application did? Are you talking about the alternate form again, just to clarify? It doesn't say. Okay, so if you're referring to the alternate form, um, it, it's, it's a year, so, how, what are they on October 1? And then next year, 
what are they on October 1? So for purposes of EPS, it doesn't need to carry over a month similar to what you needed to for nutrition because we're not, we're just going year, year by year. Uh, so it really doesn't apply the same because they are two different purposes. And just remember, if you're operating a traditional program, then we would continue that in a traditional school meals program, but not in CEP or special provision. Do you have to send out the free and reduced app along with the alternate form or just the alternate? It depends on the situation that you're operating. So if you're operating a special provisions program or a CEP program, you do not send out free and reduced applications. If you you would just send out the EPS alternate okay. form. And somebody in administration should be doing that, not child nutrition. As an SP2 school in base year, should I pull the master list April 3rd and compare with last April to determine if we want to redo our base year? Yes. Excellent job. <laughs> we need like a quick social media video to promote this from DOE. We already struggle to get lunch forms returned and parents do not understand how this helps with so many other areas. It's a work in progress. It's a work in progress and we're trying to help out with that and with and definitely getting the news out as part of this team that's here today. So absolutely, we're on board and we hear you. If the alternate economic form is done by staff outside of school nutrition, how do they know whether or not the students are directly certified as that information is confidential? They would put that information into their, your student information system. In the, they would put it in, and on the back end, the student, the direct certification information would overwrite the information that they input. So the student is getting the benefit, the best benefit that they can, whether or not whatever is put in on the EPS formula. Can we change our provision to base year if needed? What could justify that decision? You can change your SP2 if you wanted to reapply because your percentage has changed. You would just collect that information again. You would do another base year. If you want to look at your ISP and if it's over 40% and you wanted to consider doing a CEP year and apply for CEP year, you could do that as well. Special provisions to schools will use the alternate economic status form to determine additional state funding. That correct. is correct. <laughs> you get the gold star for the day. <laughs> yep. Where will the where will this info be entered into Synergy? This information is entered into the um, economic status um, module on the student screen. Uh, so it can just be entered there or it can be entered through an upload from a local SIS or through an upload file on the state reporting status screen on the enrollment. And Sorry, again, it's an economic status. It has its own it has its own upload. Again, the alternate form should not be entered by uh, nutrition staff. Correct. What will happen if the economic status forms are not filled out? So we really just need to try to collect as much information as we can about economic status for the students at this time, because this is the best way we have of determining how many students are considered economically disadvantaged. As a result, if we are not able to collect the information, the percentage of the um, economic status at the district may not be accurate, which could result in less state funding. What is the first month the alternate form can be sent home for the upcoming school year, July 1st? Yeah, actually we have it available now uh, with on our website. 
so that you can uh, work with it to create it, to make it your own and to get it prepared to go out whenever you start sending forms out. If you have separate districts in your school system and not all schools are at that 40% range, even though they're separate district, can they still participate in SP2 under the group? You wouldn't be able to group schools in different districts. So you can only group schools within the same district. And SP2 doesn't group anyone. And, and did you hear David, who's in the background here, making mm -hmm. sure that I do, I answer all these questions right, but you don't group SP2 schools. They, they're all standalone. Districts can require the alternate form, correct? Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. That would be a local decision. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's really up to your your locals as to whether you would require it. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that specifically. It does no longer fall under the federal requirements that you could not require it. So that would be a local decision. Local decision. Yep. Can you explain a little more about comparing data on April 1st from year to year? Where do we pull this data from to know if we want to redo our base year? Is it all from direct cert? Yes, it is your direct cert list. So your total enrollment list with the benefit, with the benefits listed on it. Just what you would have submitted to David last year, same thing. Um, we're looking for you to be able to have clean data each and every year um, that you can compare and to see whether or not it makes sense for you to change your operating provision. Is there a way to fill out the economic status form online? That would again be a local decision. Yeah, we've got that we've created a template for you to use locally. If somebody in your local district would like to create an online version, you're certainly able to do that. Does participating in SP2 mean that all meals will remain at no charge for students for the four year cycle? Yes. Synergy economic status in Synergy has an enter date. What date should be used? The, well, if the in order for the student to be considered for EPS, the date would have to be prior to October 1 so that it's over that October 1 date. Does it have to be during this school year? It so it would be, be during this school year. July. Yeah. Anytime between July 1 and, and October, October 1. 1. Yep. Yes, because all students would need to be re enrolled for this current school year. Yep. And then that enrollment would have to reflect that economic. Okay, July 1st to October 1st. Okay, so I guess that we've hit all of our questions. Um, please feel free to reach out. Um, we hope that this has been helpful. Um, and are clearly understood by you guys. Um, I want to thank the partners from the other teams, Paula and Allie, for being here today and helping us get through this. Um, I want We just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page moving forward um, in the next school year. So thank you very much for your time and attention, and everybody have a great evening. Thank you.